Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back from the break. We hope you had a, you had a nice break and uh, you're all back here for the last session of uh, the first day before uh, Stephen will, will close the, this up. So we're here uh, for this last session to really discuss about how future scenarios and foresight can be used for policymaking in an area of profound transition. As you all know, of course, um, strategic foresight has become increasingly prominent across different sectors in different countries, across stakeholders. And of course, that makes sense. Uh, because, of course, foresight is all about anticipating how our strategic and policy landscapes are going to evolve, how our worlds are going to be disrupted, by what, from where and when, and about what are some of the issues that are on the horizon, kind of the new challenges and opportunities that might come to bear. But it's also about what might be needed, about what the choices are that we're having actually in front of us and how those choices actually will create a future. So we've heard today a lot of, the, of some of those profound changes that are going on. We've heard a lot about uncertainties and the very strategic choices we have in front of us. And although I would argue that anyone has to think about the future when they make decisions, whatever sector you are in, whatever stakeholder you are, um, it's absolutely crucial for the public sector. Because, well, a business, for example, if they get the future wrong or they make the wrong strategic decisions for the future, you know, they might lose their investment, they might go under, it's not a pleasurable, pleasurable you know, experience, but in the public sector, you don't actually have that option. So in the public sector, we really can't rely on the world to turn out the way we expect it to be. We have to be prepared for a whole wide range of scenarios so that if profound change happens, we don't find ourselves in a situation that we can't manage because we haven't even conceived that possibility. But also beyond being prepared for what might happen, as a public sector, you're kind of mandated and we're expected to create a future that our citizens want, which is another challenge, of course. What is that common future and that vision for our, our nations, for our countries and for the world? So thinking about the future is key. I would say thinking in scenarios is even better. And bringing that future thinking and that research into policymaking is an absolute must. And we've heard that in the European Commission, in European institutions, there's been a lot of strides made in the last years around that. Like foresight is really becoming a key component of, of a lot of the policymaking processes and it's being embedded in it. So we hope today actually to have in this session some examples and cases of how this has been used in the European context and also in different countries and in different institutions. How is foresight really leveraged to support good forward-looking decision-making? And hopefully we can inspire some of the people who haven't gotten into the, into the trend yet and, and, and to come along the way. So I look very much forward to this conversation here today, um, certainly with the exceptional people um, that are on this panel. Um, so today what we're going to be doing is we're going to first hear actually from Stefan Quest, who you know is the chair of ESPAS, director general of the Joint Research Centre in the European Commission. You've seen him a couple of times today already. He will provide a keynote presentation on how the European institutions have kind of started using scenarios into policy making and, and draw some conclusions from that and share some experiences. After that, we'll go on to a panel um, with other people who have great experience. So we're fortunate today to have uh, some of the amazing minds and people who are really pushing foresight uh, into important institutions and the practice forward in bringing it to policymaking. So we have today with us Janet Quack from um, Singapore. She's the head of the Center of Strategic Futures at the government of uh, Singapore. Thank you for being here. It's quite late in Singapore, um, so very grateful. Uh, we have uh, Peter Schmidt, who is the president of the NET section of the European Economic and Social Committee here with us today. Um, not on the screen where this is my first hybrid uh, event, I have to say, so it's quite, uh, quite interesting. We have Duncan Casbex also, who is the head of foresight and, uh, at the OECD. And we have Jana Tapanayan, 
Thies, who's the Secretary General from the Government Report on the Future and Government Foresight Group at the Prime Minister's Office in Finland. Thank you so much for being here. But before we move on to the keynote speech, uh, I just want to remind you that people can actually uh, provide their questions in the Q&A function that is uh, for that. I'm sure you get the drill already from the, the, the rest of the day. Um, so we hope we can deal with some of, uh, answer some of your questions at the end of the session. So without uh, further ado, Stefan uh, Quest, can I ask you to provide your presentation? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Crystal. Thanks for the introduction. And, and it's great to be back with you this afternoon for this, uh, for this session. Uh, and here, as you say, we're going to be zooming in. We've heard this morning from uh, the vice president and a lot of other great presentations about how we're trying to embed foresight uh, in the policymaking process, how we're trying to, to keep foresight on the map uh, at, the, at the top level in the European Commission and in the institutions. And now, in, in, in this presentation this afternoon, I want briefly uh, to focus a bit in a bit more detail about the process of scenario building, because this is one of the foresight activities on which we rely to try to explore the diversity of potential futures and to really help us to build these robust and resilient strategies that we need if our policy responses are going to make sense as we go forward. So it's important to underline in, in the field of foresight that a scenario does not predict what the future will be. So they're not predictions, they're not forecasts. This is something that I spend quite a lot of time trying to explain to colleagues in other parts of the Commission who are often asking me, how come you do all this foresight work and you didn't see that coming or you didn't see that coming? It's a fair question, but we're not in the forecasting business. Um, what we're doing with foresight is trying to build these scenarios which illustrate possible futures. We build alternative scenarios which explore the future, which help us to increase our understanding of what could happen and help us, therefore, to generate intelligence for decision making. And I'm going to try and illustrate this with three examples from our practice in the Commission where we've used scenario building methodologies in the EU policymaking field. And the first one is around our work on customs and the customs union. So the customs union uh, is actually over 50 years old now in the European Union. In fact, we celebrated that 50 year anniversary back in 2018. And at that point, policymakers felt that the fast changes which were occurring, as well as celebrating the success of the customs union, warranted an in-depth reflection about what the challenges and what the future was bringing, because we understood that we couldn't stand still. And they were trying to understand what would a shared EU vision for the future of customs look like in the face of all the things coming at customs officers, uh, given all the transformations and changes we're having in the world? How could we ensure that the further policy development in a, in a stable and well-established policy area remains relevant and robust as we move forward? So to answer those questions, uh, we carried out uh, 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 an in-depth, 18-month-long foresight process, which ended up producing a wealth of policy-relevant information which then fed in to the policy process, because at the end point in the Commission, we adopted uh, a customs action plan at political level in September 2020. And this was informed by the work that we carried out uh, through the scenarios. We produced a set of four scenarios, which were all built around how dynamic the EU economy could be. And these were an important tool in creating a, a stepping stone to help us generate this long-term vision and two different policy roadmaps. And I'd say that beyond the specific recommendations for actions that were made, and these included things like the importance of working to do more harmonization and integration of IT systems, or more work on developing common training for customs officers, so quite specific recommendations. Uh, what was particularly important through this process and looking at these different scenarios was on the one hand, as well, building and, and helping to nurture a community of stakeholders who came together not just to discuss the problems of the, of the present, but also the possibilities and the potential of the future. And also, secondly, this idea of building a shared vision of the future of customs, which helped frame this action plan. So thinking together about the future and thinking together about finding these solutions through interacting on these scenarios. Very powerful process. Uh, the second example I want to share is the strategic analysis of the European Union's open strategic autonomy by 2040, which was included in this year's strategic foresight report referenced by the Vice President this morning. 
Strategic autonomy, clearly very complex, very dynamic, very multifaceted. So here we needed to take a very holistic approach because everything is interconnected, everything is interdependent. So the foresight process that we designed here had to take a very broad understanding of open strategic autonomy, and we had to try to analyze in detail the most relevant issues across five different dimensions, the geopolitical, the technological, the economic, the environmental, and the societal. So what we did is we built a participatory approach. We brought together experts, over 100 experts, across a nine-month-long process, and through co-creation with these experts, we developed a set of four scenarios using the inductive Oxford scenario planning approach, each scenario presenting a different, plausible future of the European Union in 2040. One focused around green leadership, one complex prosperity, one around economic growth above all, and one entitled retreat inwards. So these four scenarios provided a strong and robust reflection framework to help us to explore what open strategic autonomy could mean for the European Union in each of these diverse plausible futures and what might be their potential implications for the present. So for example, in the green leadership scenario, the European Union is leading by example, it's promoting a green vision for a carbon neutral way of living and the European Union and a close group of like-minded countries are seen as clean tech leaders. In this scenario, they represent 30% of the world's economy and renewable energy is providing 100% of electricity in the European Union. The European Union is using its soft power to try to convince neighboring countries and others around the world to join a group which is focused on green economy and delivering sustainable development goals. However, the majority of the world's nations continue to prioritize economic wealth with lower environmental standards. So conflicts emerge at the global level around access to resources around economic power, around trade and technology standards. So this process of showing plausible internal and external contexts for the European Union helps us to challenge assumptions about the future of the European Union, to draw relevant insights, and then to discuss what possible challenges and what opportunities we may have. And by reflecting on them in advance, we were able to contribute to increasing the long-term preparedness and I think boosting resilience in policy making. In addition, by making the future more explicit, but also enabling us to contest these scenarios, uh, we provide a kind of a wind tunnel in which we can help the policymakers to consider the adequacy and the effectiveness of the current policy responses, but also the responses that they're planning. For example, they confirm that adaptation to climate change can be an effective way to manage climate risks. So the scenario building and the overall foresight process that I'm describing here helps us to generate key trends and also to look at specific outcomes for policy, for example, with regard to our Green Deal ambitions. And more specifically, our report flags, for example, that coordinated diplomatic efforts will be absolutely crucial if we're going to succeed in the green transition and help it to become a global effort. And we saw this coming out in COP26. Indeed, it's a theme that's been coming up through some of the panel discussions that we've had during the day today. Um, our work also highlights that the green transition does offer an opportunity for the European Union to become a leader in emerging green technology sectors. For example, the manufacturing sector, where we might be trying to make cement without fossil fuels or steel without coal. So there are opportunities there for us to seize if we're able to do so. And in this context, and because the scenarios are recent, in fact they're brand new, uh, their main added value for the moment is that they've contributed to this deeper, more systemic understanding of the topic, to these multiple interlinkages and interdependencies. And in that sense, they actually contribute to an even broader set of reference foresight scenarios on the future standing of the European Union, which we also maintain in the Joint Research Center. Now this brings me to my third and final example, which is around foresight for better regulation. Developing reference scenarios for the future of the European Union, which we, as I say, are working on, has a number of very concrete benefits. And in particular, it's useful when we want to understand possible challenges to policy problems and to look at the factors which are driving change, because this helps us to anticipate possible changes in future policy objectives. 
it in a way enables us to stress test the various policy options that we're considering uh, to address our policy issues before we put them into practice. So for this reason, I'm very happy that within the European Community, uh, within the European Commission's environment, our better regulation guidelines now refer explicitly to strategic foresight as part of our better regulation toolbox. And it refers in particular to scenarios, uh, as well as to megatrends, as two main foresight methods that can and should be used by the policymaking community. These foresight exercises can be performed in impact assessments, which we are required to do when we produce legislative proposals, and they can help to identify opportunities to reduce the regulatory burden, and they can also be used in the assessment of whether existing European Union laws are fit for the future. So thanks to these kind of foresight methods, these scenarios, we can answer, or at least hope to answer, relevant questions like what are the key drivers around the policy problem? Do we actually recognize them? Are, they, are these drivers effectively dealt with? Uh, how can they change the policy problem and affect the stakeholders? And are there actually then consequences for the policy options? And within the Joint Research Center, we have a competence center on foresight, which is where we bring together all of our expertise and, and render that for the European Commission as a whole to help deliver on this need to better get ready for the future and to really apply the benefits of foresight very concretely throughout the whole policy making cycle. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, I hope I've shown through these three rather specific examples how the use of strategic foresight through scenario building can really contribute to various policy initiatives. The diversity that we've seen in these three examples, I hope illustrates that foresight can also be used at different stages of the policy cycle. It can be used to update and refresh mature established policies like the customs union. It can be used upstream for strategic reflections on issues which are coming at us like strategic autonomy. And it can be used for stress testing upcoming policy initiatives by embedding them in the better regulation toolbox and in our current ways of thinking. So hopefully through exploring alternative scenarios, strategic foresight not only helps us to steer better informed decisions, but also helps us to foster the coherence and the integration of European policies. Thank you very much. Crystal, back to you. Because also what, what you've shown is that scenarios and foresight really fits different type of purposes and probably the way you have been doing it um, is kind of depends on, on, on the foresight, um, the purpose of why you're doing foresight. And it's really good to see that, as you indicated, you can use it really at different stages of, of the process. Uh, thank you very much for that overview. Um, I'd like to turn now to our panelists uh, to share some of their experiences in using foresight and scenario planning uh, within their institutions and for their policy making. So I'd like to start first of all with uh, Jeanette. Jeanette, who, as, as we said, is uh, running kind of the Center of uh, Strategic Futures in Singapore at the government of Singapore. And as we all know, Singapore has a long history of uh, doing foresight and scenario thinking. And um, there is a center, but it's also very much permeated throughout the whole system of government. And when you go to Singapore, actually, um, what you'll notice is that there is a very vivid sense, I find, Jeanette, um, of the need to really think about disruption and about possible change, including very existential risk, right? Um, that's probably given your history, location, size, et cetera. But it, it's so you, you can kind of feel the foresight vibes when, when you talk to people um, in Singapore. So look really forward to your, uh, to your presentation here. Thanks very much, Crystal. No, you're, you're very right um, in the sense that I think we all recognize that um, because of how Singapore um, makes a living and because of our relatively short history uh, compared to you know, many of the, the nations represented in this virtual room, um, we constantly have to think about how the environment is changing around us um, and where kind of where the, the, the global system is going so that we are prepared um, for the next wave of change that comes. Um, I wanted to, to begin by, by responding to Stephen's keynote. Um, first of all, thank you very much for once again repeating that scenarios are not predictions or forecasts. 
Um, they are a completely different animal. And I thought I would talk a little bit more about how we see um, the scenarios as, as a process um, kind of feeding into how we do policy planning in our system. Uh, I thought I'd also offer some thoughts on another aspect of scenario planning that I think is, is frequently underrated and is actually one of its key strengths. Um, so Singapore has, as, I, as you've mentioned, been using scenario planning for a very long time, um, since the mid-1990s, actually, as a whole of government strategic planning tool. And it has proved to be extraordinarily useful in creating and sustaining a culture within the public service that encourages the questioning of assumptions and um, questioning kind of deeply held mental models within the service and instilling the discipline to confront those um, black, possible black elephants and possible challenges before it's, it's too late, right? Before a crisis hits. But I think the aspect of the scenarios press process that we perhaps do not highlight enough is that scenarios are actually very useful in creating a common understanding and a common language for us to talk about a very uncertain future um, in which there are challenges, but also opportunities. But standing here, looking out into the, into the future, we don't have a, a way of, of, of talking about. And so scenarios present a common platform where at least if I say, you know, the name of the scenario, everybody in the room has the same understanding of what kind of future I'm talking about. Um, and because of that, they're a useful tool for galvanizing attention and action around some of these more obvious challenges, the black elephants in the room. Um, they're a useful way for us to think the unthinkable um, and explore the big what ifs and create a um, better understanding of how we think about those challenges um, and then perhaps how we might confront blind spots in a safe and constructive way. So that, I think that's kind of one of the very underrated uh, of values of the scenario planning process. Um, and the way that we run the scenario planning process in, in the CSF, I think leverages this, this particular strength of the scenarios. Um, we consult very widely across the service at every step of the process, whether it be from formulating the driving forces to determining what scenario frameworks we want to use to even drafting the stories themselves. Um, and the reason we consult so widely is that right from the beginning, we are incepting this shared understanding of what are the trends that shape our future, what are the big questions these trends are provoking, and then what are the stories we want to tell ourselves so that we can think about these trends in constructive ways. And by involving people in the whole process right from the beginning, it gives them a sense of agency in the process. You too can help us to shape the stories. And however lightly it begins to build buy-in because people become invested in the outcome, right? They become invested in sharing that imagination, sharing that plausible future with us right from the very start. Uh, we have actually introduced other process innovations to the scenarios, the scenario planning process over time um, as our external context has changed, but also as our internal structures and processes have changed. Um, so we've, we've kind of, tinkered with the process in ways that we think maximize its value to the service. One key change we've made is actually to make the driving forces themselves a product of the process. So we are not entirely focused on the scenario narratives as a, a way of driving action, but also presenting the driving forces as something for people, for agencies to chew on, um, to consider in their own context and to focus on the particular pieces that are of more interest to them. One thing we realized along the way um, in trying to make the driving forces a product is that no one wants to read a 100-page report that you put on their table. Uh, they like the look of it. They'll tell you it's a great comprehensive product, but because it's intimidating, it's very hard for, for our time-pressed colleagues to engage with the material. And so what we've done is to make the driving forces into slightly more bite-sized cards um, that people can pick up and play with. And the cards really only contain data points and questions and, and colorful illustrations. They're ways of getting people to literally physically engage with the product. Um, we 
provide them with serving suggestions so you can use these driving forces cards to play different types of games. And in the process of playing the game, they engage with the material, they have conversations with each other about why they like this card, they don't like this card, what happens when I bash these two cards together, what kind of worlds I can create. And in that process, they become engaged in thinking about what this potential future means for them and for their agency. Um, and it's not just about the, the set of scenario stories that we've produced, but also all the trends that shape the scenario stories and our environment as well. So that's one, one um, process innovation that, that we found to be very useful for policy planning. The other is actually that we've changed how we present the scenarios. Again, back to the idea that when you put a report on someone's table, they don't necessarily always read it. So we thought we'd find other ways to communicate the scenarios to our uh, decision makers, but also to our colleagues in public service. And again, the participative immersive element. Um, so we've produced games and videos that allow them to see different slices of the stories that we're telling. Um, the videos are sometimes presented as a day in the life of, um, so you walk through these plausible futures as a character. Um, and the games are designed for you to feel the central tensions of some of these scenarios. Rather than experience them with your brain, you experience them with your heart. And we've discovered that in kind of the policy debriefs afterward, um, people come up with different responses. They prioritize differently if they've experienced the scenarios rather than read them or watched them. So I, I thought I'd offer some of these, these um, process innovations for, for discussion. Uh, the last point I wanted to make was that uh, scenarios are great for identifying and agreeing on the challenges and opportunities of the future. I think we all agree on this, but that's, not, that's necessary but not sufficient for public policy. And one thing we need to consider is how we can then use the scenarios to move action, um, for which we often continue to see obstacles. One of the big obstacles to my mind is that frequently the team that does the scenarios work is not the team that carries the action. You've got to hand over to a policy execution team. And how we execute that handover and kind of close the loop to monitoring progress is an ongoing, I think, experiment uh, that I'd love to hear from, from other panelists on how they might have cracked that difficult um, problem. So I'm going to stop there and hand the time back to you, Crystal. Thank you very much, uh, Jeanette. Indeed, there's been a lot of uh, more innovation happening than uh, what it used to be like reports. You had big reports and that was kind of the way foresight was being, uh, be being presented. And then, of course, like that's not the best way to get it into any type of policy making, right? So it, it always reminds me of uh, scenarios are the art of strategic conversation, as Case van der Head and one of the gurus of uh, scenarios would say. It is really about conversation. It's really about kind of mental models and, and assumptions. And, and that is taking people on a journey, like we've also heard from Stefan, um, that, that that is kind of part of the process. Thank you very much. We'll come back to some of those uh, those points. I'd like to give the word now to uh, to Peter, who is uh, working on issues around agriculture, rural development, the environment, and mainly being a, a user of Foresight, who's actually looking at, at some of the Foresight to try to develop a vision of what the future should be, might be, and, and make policy recommendations. So maybe Peter can enlighten us on some of the ways um, you know, that uh, Foresight links with uh, recommendations and how it works in his, um, you know, in his area of the world. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Crystal, for giving me the floor. Um, exactly on that, what you, what you said. So I'm, I come from the, from the civil society. And um, we, from the civil society, we are happy to get input and uh, foresights from the, from, from the science. We heard today a lot of keywords like uh, democracy, um, system thinking, holistic approaches, um, or, or, or participation. And uh, our house, the ESC, is exactly doing this. And give you, telling you a short story on the food system, uh, what we did years ago uh, when it came to the, to the debate on agriculture system, on the common agriculture policy. So we in the ESC said we want to have an idea on a comprehensive food policy in Europe. And um, what we did was the following. We said, 
once the UN decided having the, 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 the 2030 agenda means the 17 SDG goals, we said we must make the food system fit uh, to be sustainable, to be uh, resilient. At that time, uh, we knew that uh, we're going to have um, extreme weather impact. We didn't know that we were going to have a COVID crisis. This is what we didn't know. We assumed that we could have some cyber attacks, but not in this extent what we are facing, we are facing now. But we knew we must have an other approach in the, in the food system. So what did, we, what did we do? We invited science, we invited uh, stakeholders, we invited the commission and said, we would like to discuss with you a comprehensive food policy for Europe. And um, the surprise was, uh, there was, an, there was an, an, an huge interest, um, and we saw that, and we were not really aware of that, that six uh, DGs were present in this, um, in this, in this first hearing um, to, to, to have a look at the comprehensive food policy. The reaction was, from all the stakeholders, the same. A comprehensive food policy? Oh my God. So this is not possible. And then we started a debate together with the science and the civil society. What are the needs? What are the means in order to come to a resilient and sustainable, sustainable food system? And, and this is exactly, I think, what we have to talk about, that if we have kind of ideas, making the systems resilient, then we have to have at first a holistic approach. Secondly, we must have uh, a participatory approach. And thirdly, it must fit into the democratic processes, um, which we have. And we as ESC, we propose different, different measures. I don't go into details because uh, you can read this, what uh, we proposed for a comprehensive uh, food system. But one of these uh, uh, proposals which we did uh, was that we said we must establish uh, European food policy councils. We must establish national, regional and local food policy councils in order to have holistic approaches and adjust the food system to the, the needs on being sustainable. And uh, today we are happy. We do not know whether the Commission uh, made the farm to fork uh, strategy because of our paper. Probably not. Uh, but we are happy that the Commission uh, 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 took the decision saying we must have a farm to fork a strategy across the across the food supply chain, and that was a, this was a good a good decision. What we still missed, this is just a, a, just a, a hint or a point to the Commission. We just miss these food policy councils because we think this is one key element uh, for a participatory approach uh, involving the, the citizens and all the all the stakeholders. And the ESC is is really ready to do this because we have. Uh, in our composition with the House of Civil Society. Our composition is we have employers, we have trade unions, I come from the trade union side, we have environmentalists, we have all, in order to discuss foresights, in order to, dis to, to, to see what, is, what are the needs for policy making. It's not only on this. Uh, a second example is we, uh, we produced an, op an opinion on, on the sustainable, sustainable economy we need. Um, we made a an, similar process on this, and uh, we are not, not in the end of this process. But what we saw in this food example, how important it is that we go into this. And recently, we adopted an opinion on uh, strategic autonomy on sustainable food systems. That's we are quite happy that uh, one of the strategic areas uh, um, in ESPAS is, is food and food systems because we think that we are, we are ready. So why this was important for us? This work uh, been done ahead of the policy making process made us ready now to participate in the process, in the, in the, you know, in the, in the implementing process uh, already. So and I think this is important that the policymakers invite much more and structured the civil society rather than just make a decision, invite lobbyists, and then see how we can adjust the policy, um, uh, so the policy process. No, it must go exactly the other, way, the other way around. And Janet said this, invite people being member of the process, being member of this, of this economy, 
of this of the civil society uh, environmentalists make them to owners of this process and that makes for lobbyists much much more difficult to go into other into other directions i let it I leave it like here um, and happy to discuss it later thank you Thank you very much, uh, Peter. You you very much indicated how, how foresight can be used for system, you know system wide kind of change and and to create some of that energy and that that alliances actually to create like big changes where it is needed. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Duncan, um, you've been in the OECD for a while now, and I believe it's about, I calculated kind of, it's about eight years ago, I think that foresight has really kind of been stepped up in um, OECD uh, with, the, with positions and, and a team being created in a significant way within the Office of the Secretary General. And a lot of things have happened uh, in the meantime. So if you can share some of your uh, success stories, let's say, on, on scenarios and some of your insights on how to best bring it to policymaking. Well, certainly, thank you very much, Crystal. Thank you, Stephen, and thanks to all of the, the organizers. And uh, well, it's actually, I was surprised to learn that strategic foresight has been alive and well at the OECD, sort of going well back into the 1960s. And I, I'm constantly meeting people who are telling me about uh, fascinating work that was done back then too. But but you're right that uh, the initial sort of, the, the recent incarnation has been really growing over the last 10 years. And we've been really taking a strong focus to building strategic foresight into public policy, making the same, similar points that, uh, that of course, uh, Vice President Shevkovich has been making about how foresight is not uh, a luxury, it is an indispensable ingredient to due diligence in public policy making, uh, all the more so in the world like today, uh, where we're seeing just a, a, such a rapid pace of change and high uncertainty. So I want to do something a little bit ambitious now and actually tell you, give you two examples of uh, scenario building, uh, one which is a, a recent exercise that we've just completed last spring, and another that is a, an exercise that is in process. And so I will attempt to briefly share my screen and, uh, and hope that this, I can put up a couple of slides here. Let's see, and we will do the, ah, the view, bear with me one moment while I start the upper view, there we go. All right, so, um, the, the first example I want to give is really an initiative that we did that was a bit uh, new and unusual for us in that it was actually applying strategic foresight, not just to public policy areas um, and not just for the purpose of, of governments and uh, government public policymakers, but actually to the OECD itself as an organization. As you may know, last year was the, uh, well, this year, in fact, is the 60th anniversary of the, of the OECD. And so we thought it was an appropriate time to think you know, where could the OECD need to be in, in 2035? What would the world need of us then? And so we, we designed these scenarios principally with that in mind, although also with an intent to, to contribute to broader questions of, um, of global collaboration that may also be shifting and emerging in the coming, in the coming years. So just briefly, uh, three scenarios that we, we looked at here. The first is what we're calling multi-track world. And this is you know, recognizing that right now, I think we're, we're all conscious that we're living in a world uh, where there's a lot of geopolitical transition uh, questions about future rivalry between um, China and the US, and perhaps uh, more broadly, a kind of decoupling. And there's probably a a, a general sense that either we're going to kind of get over that hump and keep globalization chugging along or that it's going to you know really bifurcate and we decided we wanted to look at this this alternative option which is really about what if that's uh, the world does sort of deglobalize to a certain extent but in a much messier way and it not not so neat into uh, as a bifurcation but actually we looked at five different clusters some of them geographic regional based perhaps some of them not even geographic and so it was really to sort of challenge some of our, our assumptions particularly in the organization about what the, uh, the the broader range of potential futures that a a world order a shifting world order could look like so the next scenario was actually going a little bit in the in the different direction, uh, which was we're calling virtual worlds. And this is one where I think there's a common assumption, maybe even a common hope that after you know COVID settled down and settles down, we're all able to meet back in Brussels in person for the next ESPAS, that you know, we'll sort of bounce back from this experiment in virtual living that we've all had to experience over the past few years. 
uh, a couple of years, it feels, it feels like a few. <laughs> um, so, but we're exploring, well, what if in fact that, that doesn't happen to the extended spectrum? What if we actually see you know, the, the virtual reality and augmented reality and a number of these technologies are just taking off and becoming more and more engaging. And humanity is spending you know, more and more of our lives really within virtual space because it is just uh, for work, for, for entertainment, for learning, for socializing uh, is actually um, uh, where we can, we can express ourselves genuinely and have, and have high quality interactions with others. And what also could we see in this world is where there's a kind of an impatience by, by citizens and consumers to, to, for being put in walled gardens, either national or regionally based walled gardens or walled, walled gardens based on different you know, corporations. And really a kind of strong demand for a very highly interoperable um, metaverse, not a metaverse that's based on one company controlling it, but really on a wide group of organizations coming together to create a, a sort of seamless web that one can navigate through. So, and finally, uh, our, our scenario, uh, third scenario was called vulnerable world. And this is really uh, trying to challenge the assumption that we have that, you know, that really the global, the global problems we have to face in the coming 10 to 15 years will continue to look like the ones we've been familiar with. I mean, particularly most recently COVID, but then beyond that, of course, climate, which we're all now very much in the, in the middle of. And we're raising the, the, uh, the slightly frightening possibility that as challenging as our current global challenges are to address, we could actually be faced with some challenges that are even uh, more significant, where uh, a previously uh, unprecedented level of kind of near perfection in global collaboration may be required to address them. And some of these are, are global catastrophic risks, global existential risks. I won't get into the details. I mean, this could be unaligned to artificial general intelligence or genetically engineered pandemics or so forth. It's less important what the actual threat itself is as to how do we ensure that we're really developing the 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 means for collaboration and the underpinnings necessary for successful global, global collaboration on issues where we really cannot afford to fail. So that's just an example, uh, three examples of our scenarios. And we they, they stimulated a number of reflections within the OECD, but also I think more, you know, more broadly in our discussions uh, about you know uh, the, the bridge building role that we can play across the growing divisions about our interactions with with other non-state actors about the whole growing space of policy within virtual space uh, and about really as I mentioned these how do we how do we put in place the the mechanisms and the foundations for successful global collaboration and how can can we best contribute to that. So I, I would say that we've had a number of these discussions with uh, participants from across the OECD, various directorates, committees, ambassadors, and so forth, as well as a number of outside groups. And while you know there are a few areas where I can see it's actually going to lead to something concrete, I think the the most, even more important than that, are the kind of the way that it's it's created what you know you call Christel, these these strategic conversations. I really see it resulting in the kinds of real big picture conversations that otherwise just often don't get to happen. And I think that's what I feel most proud about in terms of its impacts so far. So let me briefly now turn to the second example, which is about uh, foresight for successful net zero transitions. And this came out uh, initially of a meeting of our global government foresight community uh, in 2020, where we asked ourselves, what are some of the key issues that we need to collaborate on around the world and bring our public uh, policy foresight capacities to bear in a joint way to address some of the most important issues of our time? And clearly, you know, obviously, the, the whole issue of, of climate came up. This is an area where there's it's uh, you know there's a tremendous amount of effort and work that's already being done, particularly in sort of futures and uh, in forecasting and modeling. What is the we ask ourselves, you know, what's the niche that strategic foresight can really contribute here that otherwise isn't being done or isn't being done sufficiently? And what we've we've come up to, you know, collectively, really, is this idea that what the climate debate really needs from us now is a, a set of instruments that are going to help us to stress test and future proof net zero transition strategies. Governments around the world are designing these strategies now. They're going to be implemented over 20, 30 years based on important investment decisions, policy decisions that are being made now. 
despite the fact that we will be facing you know, significant change and massive uncertainty during that time. So how can we start to identify some of these areas of uncertainty so that we can be thinking through proactively what are the ways that they can create new challenges for our net zero strategies, but also new openings, new opportunities that we wouldn't be considering if we were just sort of basing our thinking on an extrapolation of the status quo. So uh, finally, just we're mid-stage of this now, but what we're doing is identifying a number of these possible uh, potential disruptions across the, the steep areas that or steep areas that many of you be familiar with. And what we aim to do with that is actually use those, I'll stop the sharing there, um, is, is use those to build, uh, to provide the foundation for then building scenarios that then, for example, a government could take and could, could pick several of these potential disruptions that would be most relevant for them, combine those as a, into a sort of foundation for to build a few scenarios, and then really use those to, uh, to test, uh, stretch their, their thinking about their, to enrich their, their own net zero strategies. And this is certainly an area where we've been working with a number of colleagues, both within the European Commission and, and more broadly, and, and look forward to collaborating. And I think there'll, of course, be some excellent synergies with the, the work that you're doing uh, in light of your, your upcoming foresight report for next year. So thanks again, and look forward to, uh, to discussing more on all of these. Thank you, Duncan. Uh, and that's, uh, that's fantastic. You're really into that uh, strategic conversation and trying to kind of work with people's mental models and, and challenging some of those from, from kind of the position and the objective that you're having. So um, it's been a pleasure also to work uh, on some of those um, uh, in the way you work very collaboratively, actually, with the different foresight entities uh, across the world. So, um, Jana. Um, so, Jana, um, I, I would uh, argue that Finland has maybe one of the oldest traditions also, and one that has been, is uh, I would say, uh, it's, it's very broad, actually, the actors that are playing into the foresight field within um, Finland. Um, it, it goes from academics to very early school um, to, to within the most democratic uh, policy uh, systems like uh, foresight being used uh, clearly by the parliament, etc. So I would, uh, for you, it is very linked, actually, right, foresight into the democratic political uh, decision making. So I'd love to hear from you um, about your, your work, some of the things that are happening in Finland. And, and I know you're changing also quite, quite a number of, of things to push foresight even closer to policymaking. So looking forward to hearing, uh, Jana. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I will be sharing my screen. Um, <clears throat> just push the whole of presentation. Yes. So um, um, can you actually see the, the whole screen? Uh, it's yeah. not... We see the whole screen plus the things on the side. So we see a screen. Yeah. I wonder, OK. Um, Okay, I'm going to put this and here because if it doesn't work, that I because I'm sharing uh, the, the 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 complete um, uh, screen, but it seems that it doesn't really share. But I, I hope that you can still see uh, the slide. So um, a, a few uh, comments about the the process that we have been doing um, in the last say one and a half years. Uh, we've been building the scenarios on on um, uh, Finland for for future generations. The main foresight uh, forum, um, we have the EU-wide foresight network, which is now um, the, 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 the newly established um, uh, EU-wide foresight network uh, by uh, Vice President Sefcovic. We're very happy to be uh, part of that, and we are very much uh, looking forward to the collaboration. Um, government foresight group. Um, it's um, it was um, founded in 2015. We have a ministerial foresight panel, um, which is um, there is a, a, a representative of each of the ministries, and this has been the the main body uh, to deliver and 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 carry out our scenario work. We have the national foresight network, 
And um, of course, since um, almost 30 years, the Parliamentary Committee for the Future. The main foresight processes is the government report on the future uh, that I'll be uh, sharing with you now, and then um, our ministerial future reviews. So we have a very long uh, track record in creating future-oriented structures of uh, decision-making, and we have a very broad uh, consensus of the need for foresight and very considerable acceptance within various levels of government. Um, openness and trust are um, are uh, key to, to, to the way we work. And we engage uh, stakeholders broadly, but also citizens, businesses, and other actors. Uh, our outcomes are available for informing a wider public debate, uh, electoral discussions, and for policy development. And we uh, invest continuously in our capacities and capabilities. Um, I think I will try to share my screen in a different way because it looks like uh, the slides are not moving. I hope by sharing my whole screen, this will help. Yes. Okay, here we are. So um, apologies for that. Um, so I just uh, went through these, these sort of the main, main foresight fora and, and the main, main foresight uh, processes. Um, So remodeling the, the government report on the future. Um, so this forms the futures dialogue that uh, is between the government and the parliament already almost 30 years. And it is given to the parliament uh, once um, electoral period, uh, looking at long-term issues. And it uh, aim is to identify important issues for decision-making that require special attention in the future. And, um, uh, the it's it's opening the debate for the for the coming years now the main uh, changes uh, to this uh, government report on the future is threefold so we will from now on submit the report uh, to the parliament in two parts uh, in order to um, promote uh, dialogue and inclusion. Uh, the second is that we develop scenarios uh, taking into account the uncertainty of the global operating environment to support preparedness. And the third one is that the first part of the report is actually done by all the ministries of Finland. So previously there has been some outsourcing and uh, and this is actually taking accountability of that thinking part which is not such easy thing um, especially when we uh, move into dealing with uncertainty the um, the complexity of the operating environment also requires us to take a more comprehensive approach to foresight work than before. So what we have done is we have moved now from one team to um, overall pic picture in this first part of the report, um, moving from continuity thinking to dealing more with uncertainty and complexity. Um, like I said, from outsourcing the foresight to dealing uh, and, and doing it ourselves. So this has been a, a, a very steep learning curve. And this has, of course, then increased the foresight capacity of the state administration, but it has also required a greater investment um, uh, of resources um, than before. Uh, very central is this co-creation, cooperation, participation, We've had multiple uh, stakeholders participating in here. Uh, we've had ministries, expert researchers, the national network, and citizens. And um, for, with this new way of working, we have pushed for anticipatory governance. As part of this, we've had citizen dialogues, um, 50 dialogues on the future of Finland. And, um, and especially what we aim to do is to integrate and, and try to engage people who normally would not participate in these kind of uh, processes. Um, the, what, what is important now when we have um, uh, done the scenarios ourselves is, is to always remind what, what we can achieve with scenarios, what they are, what they are not. Um, 
So I think this communication of what we can ach achieve is, is, is very crucial. And to sort of uh, that we're not trying to guess the future right. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's an important message to always convey. But, um, but what is, we're not sort of describing what is likely to happen, but what is possible. And, um, and here uh, you can see the steps that we made and each of the ministries. So it looks quite light when we, for example, uh, look at the environmental analysis. It took quite a number of months and we had teams of ministries who prepared an analysis. We, so we, like uh, Duncan showed these steep categories um, in the same way we were uh, looking extensively um, at the uh, at the operating environment and uh, developed our understanding, cross governmental, whole of government understanding on issues uh, um, which Finland is facing. Um, so we've this collaboration, co-creation, participation that has been mentioned was very crucial to to the way we work. Um, so the twelve ministries were the main body who actually, you know, did all the the hard thinking part. But we have engaged multiple stakeholders in this whole whole process, and we've had ministerial workshops. We've had. Uh, cross-governmental workshops, um, the citizen dialogues. We have a steering group um, of all the political parties um, who have also guided um, the work. And um, and the what has been sort of unique now is that we've tried to combine these scenarios with the citizen dialogues and they complement each other. So many of the issues um, that we have uh, sort of identified in the scenario work, we can we have also identified in the in the uh, citizen dialogues. And so it's kind of this thinking: the future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. Very sorry about the slide. I'm a little bit um, um, uh, going over time, so I'll stop here. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Jana. It's always very impressive uh, with the you know relative small size actually of the team that you're with, the, the amount of work you can do because the way you do it is so much kind of distributed through the system also, which I'm sure creates uh, it's, it's it's problems also, but it certainly creates also a kind of a really good kind of thinking um, that 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 most of the speakers have been talking about to have that dialogue actually that strategic dialogue about the future um, that sometimes might be slow um, and that, that deals with mental models and assumptions and but that is so powerful ultimately in the end so thank you so much I'd like to uh, have maybe a quick follow-up uh, question for, for all of you. You can decide if you want to take it and how you want to take it. But um, we're certainly, what I'm noticing is that we're moving very much uh, beyond kind of the, the point that Stephen was also referring to. There was a time I remember that foresighters would say, like, complain that decision makers weren't paying attention to foresight. And if only they had, then we wouldn't be in this trouble or we would be in a better situation. So I, we're moving really much beyond kind of that, that stage where we're seeing a lot of high start of hardwiring, I would call it, of foresight in, in um, decision-making processes. And certainly in Europe, we see it a lot, but also in all of your organizations. So the question that I have for you is now, when it becomes more kind of a, a fixed part of a process, of a real decision-making process, of a real vision-making process, and it's not just a thinking exercise to say so, um, it, it also has some other consequences, right? So um, we've heard a lot of uh, kind of the good practices, you know, what we have to do, we have to make sure we're clear about the process, making sure it translates well to decision-makers. We have to make it system-wide participatory, bring all the stakeholders in, link it to democratic processes where democracies are... Um, but but I would like to hear from you, either from your practice, from your experience, or from your foresight uh, about foresight. What do you see might be some kind of pitfalls that we might be seeing, and that we should just all start paying attention to, to make sure that in the future the power of scenarios can actually um, be maintained, like all the benefits we can get from it, once it gets into really political or policy decision-making. Um, is there anything you see that we should start to think about on how the practice works, how it is being hardwired to make sure that we keep on kind of having, the power, uh, that the power of the tool is not lost in the process? 
Um, Duncan and I see, see you shake your head. Uh, I know you have some opinions about that also. So can I call on you first? Sure, um, absolutely. Well, um, first of all, I just want to say I think that's a really excellent question. I mean, I think we are seeing a uh, resurgence in the demand and interest in foresight for a number of reasons. I mean, we've, um, and COVID has just added another layer of, of, uh, of a movement that I think was was already growing beforehand. And, and the work um, that, the, that the European Union has been doing in recent years, and also, you know, another sign would be the um, the, the common agenda recently uh, put out by the Secretary General of the United Nations calling again for, you know, the embedding of strategic foresight as one of the quintet of capabilities for re revitalizing the, the United Nations. These are all signs of, of their growing interest, but with that comes uh, a really growing responsibility for all of us to be asking exactly this kind of question. And I've been toying with this recently, um, calling it a little bit of, you know, the need for a Hippocratic oath for foresight, you know, that that idea of first do no harm. And so I've got a, a growing list of the kind of ways that I think we need, you know, potential pitfalls and ways that we need to be careful and think about more. But I, I'll, I'll mention just maybe a, a couple of them now. I mean, one is really that what we do in foresight one of the, the most valuable services we contribute is shaking people off their certainties. I think you know a lot of errors were made, particularly you know in the 20th century, from an overconfidence of our of ability to plan and predict and to make decisions based on on that. And we we're kind of saying to people continually, "Careful, it's not so simple. You know, be prepared for alternatives." I think the risk can come is if people, decision makers think, well, well, now we've done a foresight process and we've considered three different scenarios, so, so we must be ready. Now we can go ahead boldly. And I think we need to continue to, to maintain a sense of humility and saying, you know, really, uh, our scenarios won't necessarily have covered all of the waterfront. You know, we're likely to be surprised by something that comes, you know, completely different. We're, we're, still, we're always working to identify those areas. But I think it's really important that we continue to suggest that, you know, although it's a step towards making our policies more resilient and adaptive and adaptable. Uh, it's it's really just the first step and, and we need to kind of maintain that humility. Uh, I mean, a related point I think is just also being very increasingly careful in our work about what are the biases embedded in the, the scenarios and the future thinking that would be for, put forward. Um, these can, you know, as, as other people call it, have the risk of colonizing the future. They have a risk of really, uh, of, you know, visions that scenarios of the future can be very powerful on the imagination in ways that can, you know, can be really supportive of, of action that can improve well-being, but also in ways that can serve to, you know, to, to maintain the status quo or to privilege certain interests. And I think we need to be you know, more savvy and cognizant of that. And one of the key solutions to that is really just engaging in a really broad participatory dialogue in, in strategic foresight to, to challenging even the invisible biases we might have. And if I just throw in a third really quick one, I think it's there's also a risk that foresight can become too much of a technocratic question. And really some of the most important issues, I mean, there are technocratic parts of it for sure, um, but some of the most important issues that we need to grapple with and that foresight brings are really issues around shifting value. How are we going to, to find and navigate our way through very different worlds? And those are conversations that need to have outside of the public service for sure, but they do need to happen within the public service. And I think it's important that above all, we, we, we don't shy away from those kind of questions and we actually bring them forward and, and nourish the, those discussions that need to happen. Thank you very much, Duncan. Uh, Peter, Jeanette, Jana, anyone wants to add something to it, Jeanette? I'll jump in. Um, just to add a little bit to Duncan's first point about um, having a sense of humility um, around the foresight process. Um, the, the thing I wanted to add was also that um, we also need to remember that the foresight tools that we we love the most and tend to use the most aren't always the best suited for every task, right? Scenarios are great for some things, but not all things. And as the system becomes familiar with the particular foresight process and starts to imbue that with kind of more faith that it will solve all of our foresight needs and problems at once, um, that's also another way that you can fall into some of the pitfalls um, in believing that uh, the tool can tell you more about what you need to know than it actually can. Um, I'm reflecting on this also because in, in our conversations around the scenarios, sometimes 
in recent months, we've been talking about the difference between scenario planning and contingency planning and how you don't really need scenario planning in order to talk about really known knowns that you just need to sit down and deal with. And that is a different problem than not understanding an uncertain future, which is what scenarios are great for. Using the wrong tool is going to drive you down unproductive pathways. And, and that can also backfire on kind of the foresight process itself. So I thought that is one pitfall um, that practitioners often also fall into because we love our tools so much. Thank you so much. Uh, Jana, Peter? Um, yes. Um, uh, perhaps I'll uh, add uh, with the experience we just had with this uh, scenario work. Um, it's, it's, um, I, I think one of the challenges is when we start to really take uh, accountability of that thinking part of the thinking about the future. Um, and, and public servants are actually doing the job is that it is very difficult, um, you know, thinking in um, thinking about uncertainty is not the typical thing what is being done. And so it's easy actually to look at the influencing factors, um, you know, trends, mega trends, the continuity. So where we where we sort of uh, try to understand where the world is heading in a continuum, that's kind of easy. And it usually falls to some ministry's responsibility. It's an area where perhaps there is quite a substantial information and understanding. And uh, uh, But when we move uh, to dealing with uncertainty, um, it, uncertainty may cause anxiety um, because we don't know. And, uh, and I think that's very important that we start to embrace uh, uncertainty more and develop our ways in, in, in dealing with uncertainty. And, um, and, and, and when we then even so, uh, for example, if we look at um, uh, some of our critical uncertainties, uh, even then, it still might be something that you are, you can, there are few ministries perhaps uh, that are responsible for that certain uh, topic, say climate change or, um, or, or, or some other issues. Um, but then when we move into that scenario building and, 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 and working with all ministries of Finland, we start to go into kind of no man's land. It's, it's something that is uniquely new. Nobody's done it before. Nobody has thought about these things. It's kind of an emergent process. And, 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 and you have to sort of, um, uh, it's, it's, it's new to everybody. And, and then to, to, to create that whole of government um, way of working so that um, everybody feels that this is, this is still, um, it's no longer sort of my ministry's responsibility, but I still feel I'm, I'm responsible or I, I, you know, I have skin in the game. And I think there's, there is still a, a learning process how to move all of the ministries, uh, we have differences, of course, in the, the, the readiness or the, the capacities of the ministries uh, to do foresight, uh, whether they've done scenario work before or not. Um, so in this whole of government kind of processes, there are some challenges which also relates to what is the sort of the maturity level of foresight, if one could say that, uh, uh, within within different ministries and to bring that maturity level to sort of the same level. Um, so yeah, that, that well, would be something I'd... Yeah, that's a good reminder. It's an intellectual, thinking about foresight that about the future is an intellectual process, but it's, it's also an emotional journey, of course, because we're, we've not been raised to answer, I don't know, or it depends, right? So it, it's not always an, an, an easy place to be, but foresight actually, because of the structure, the way we do things and the anticipatory type of, of, of work, um, the whole goal is that you get more empowered to actually deal with these uncertainties, right? It's kind of a tool to get you empowered in a place that otherwise you might shut down because you just don't want to see uh, the threats that might be coming up because you have no clue how to deal with it, right? So, uh, Peter, anything you, you want to add? The, the micro, does, does it work? 
Yeah, no, it works. Yes, that's, that's fine. Super. So, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, just, just briefly, some of the things have been already said. Um, and the, the first point is really a structured involvement of the civil society from the beginning on. If we do not do that, then we are in the first pitfall. We see that in a, in a lot of fields of policymaking uh, processes on the one hand side and also in the producing of the foresight. So that means that's the first point. Second point is defragmentation, defragment the policymaking process. I know, uh, Jan Jana, you, you, you mentioned that. This, this is quite difficult. As we know, we are all happy to have our own silos. But if we want to have holistic pr approaches, uh, then we have to defragment it and always to remind them. Third point, uh, that's a more, uh, for me, a more a very, very important and political point is to see, um, get rid of market believing. That means for me, I'm not against market solutions, but I think we must be clear that n the market is not ready to solve the problems if we do not have a level playing field. And that's an important point. Uh, we come from a policy which said mm, the market will regulate, uh, organize everything, but this is not really, really the case. So this market believing must come in the end and not in the beginning of the, of the thinking. Fourth and last point, we have to integrate in all foresights and in all policy making processes uh, the social aspect. We have to see if we do not predict, if we do not assume or, 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 or have in mind what implications this have on the social and on, on social groups, then we will fail on all foresights in all scenarios we will, we, we, we will build. So this is, that's why the first point and the last point closes the cycle, integrate the civil society. Thank you so much, Peter. And so before handing it back over uh, to Stephen to hear some of his uh, takeaways and to, to close uh, the, to close off this session to go to the to the closing, I really want to thank um, Stephen and Jeanette and Peter and Duncan and Yana and the conference organizers to be able to have this great conversation. And I hope many people are going to be inspired to continue to work on getting really that foresight um, done and actually bringing it to decision making. It's it's sometimes it's it's hard, uh, but it's so uh, so valuable. So um, thank you very much for the opportunity to have this uh, conversation here, Stephen. Up to you. Well, th thank you, thank you so much um, for to all of you for the for this really great discussion. Um, I mean, I, I don't have the pretension now to try and conclude your um, your great conversation, but I mean, what I've been listening to very carefully. I've taken a lot of notes. I can tell you um, uh, both the the power of scenarios uh, and and then the pitfalls piece at the end, which was really super interesting. Um, but if I just try to play back a little bit of what I what I really took out of these different um, very very uh, interesting presentations. I mean, we had some really great specific examples of where scenarios have been used uh, to very good effect. And I'd like to thank you for sharing, because I think the, the concrete scenarios really help bring this, this practice to life. Um, we, held, we had some good, I think, um, uh, foundational elements that we absolutely have to get right if we're going to be doing good foresight and good scenarios. So the, the words like holistic, uh, participatory or co-creation, the democratic uh, angle, uh, the importance of openness and trust, these kind of foundational aspects which we really, really need to be uh, concentrating on from the beginning uh, right the way through to the, to the end of the process. Um, and we also had some, some really interesting um, ideas about you know, why scenario, the power of scenarios in a public policy space. Uh, I really like this idea um, that the, the scenarios help to open up a safe space where we can question assumptions. Uh, in, a, in a different way than just sort of producing policy and uh, in a rather linear way. Um, and the fact that the, the process of building the scenarios in itself helps to create agency, it helps to create inclusion, and it helps to involve uh, both civil society but also the policymakers in the process uh, in a much more interactive way. Um, uh, and I, I very much like, uh, Jeanette, your, your, your contribution about the innovations that you're playing with, um, because I think you, you pointed to a couple of, of issues, and it links a bit then with the pitfalls, that, the piece that we had at the end. Um, your process innovations uh, were, 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 very, were very interesting. Uh, the, the, the move towards more experiential ways of engaging with the scenarios, rather than just handing over a 100-page report and saying, read this and you'll be wiser, you actually engage by, by getting them to touch it and to feel it and to interact with it. I think that's something I'm, I'm curious to actually uh, uh, explore in our uh, environment here. 
And also, you, you kind of threw out a question at the end of your presentation about the, how to move from the foresight scenarios into the action phase. And that's really, I think, the key, the key difficulty that a lot of us in the community are wrestling with. That connected them with, with some of the pitfalls that you've raised, um, this, this, um, the need to remain humble or the need to keep this humility and not to get complacent, uh, and indeed not to allow our interlocutors to get complacent, that they think they have a nice foresight report and so they have all the answers. I think that's a, that's a real uh, risk for us if we, if we end up in that space. Um, the importance of picking the right tools for the job. Uh, uh, and, and I think, Jana, you were the one who made the point about helping the, the policymakers to be um, uh, comfortable with uncertainty. Uh, there's a certain desire in the policy field for people to want certainty and to want to know what to do. And we're confronting them with our foresight scenarios with a lot of uncertainty and we need to help them to deal with the anxiety that that, that, that creates so that we can have uh, really rich conversations about how we can overcome some of, these, some of these challenges. And that connects in a bit with Peter's final point there about the need to keep everybody involved because if you do it in a closed loop, you, you, you lose agency. If you keep people involved, you have a greater chance of really getting, uh, getting a good result. So those were just some of, the, some of the, the takeaways I took from this very, very rich discussion. Um, Christelle, thanks to you for, for, for hosting it. Do you want to, to, to come back with a, with a rebound before I move into the next session um, and, uh, and, and, and start to conclude today's, today's event? No, thank you. It's, it's always great to see what you take out of it. So uh, that was a great summary uh, of, of some of the key messages. So um, thank you again for having this conversation. We, and we hope it's going to help uh, ourselves and other people to actually engage with foresight and bring it to decision making. So um, good luck with uh, the rest of the conference and thanks. OK, well, many thanks to you and thanks to all the panel for the really, for the really great discussion. We go straight on? OK. So now we move straight into the closing session. Um, and I have the, the, the privilege and um, slightly unenviable task, I have to say, of attempting to, to conclude uh, uh, what's been an incredibly rich day of, of discussion. Um, I'd first of all like to thank uh, everybody who's been participating and presenting in today's uh, event. Uh, and I'd also like to thank all of you who've been following online uh, and dipping into the, into the various parts of the, uh, of the conference. It's been a real pleasure to be able to host this, this first day on behalf of the European Commission. If we go back to the beginning of the day, uh, we heard the political steer from Vice President Shevkovich uh, and the different ministers of the future um, uh, about the, their responses to the Commission's annual strategic foresight report. I mean, they had a very rich discussion. And what we heard uh, was, on the one hand, the vibrant uh, array of national foresight activities that are now emerging within the European Union and, and beyond, of course, uh, we heard about the power of networking, uh, the importance of building this foresight community at political level uh, amongst the member states and also at institutional level. We heard about the importance of building this European Union vision so that we can uh, develop foresight capability together. Uh, and we heard about the importance of embedding foresight in policy making and linking it to these practical applications. Uh, as the Spanish minister said, uh, it's the right way to do politics. Um, and these very practical examples of foresight, I think, have enriched our discussions throughout the day. We've heard a, a rich theme of, of good examples of foresight activity. Um, uh, the fact that the ministers are now discussing this on a regular basis in the foresight network, and we're already thinking about next year's uh, annual strategic foresight report, which will be around the theme of the green and digital transition um, and how they can best be deployed together is, I think, a good, a good sign of how foresight is remaining very relevant to the current most pressing demands of our citizens and our societies. Um, we had a great discussion uh, later on amongst the Young Talent Network um, who were bringing a range of a bit more out-of-the-box insights uh, on this issue. Um, they were giving us some examples of how industry can support public institutions to imagine how the digital uh, transformation might happen, how digital technology can help deliver on sustainability, uh, in particular how we can maybe leverage better the speed and the ease of access of digital 
to drive uh, the green transition that we all know we need to have if we're to remain sustainable. Um, and we heard a bit about what the European Commission is doing in this respect as well. We also had a, a very interesting uh, and rather eye-opening intervention on, on the impact of the digital in, in transition on what we eat, uh, on our food systems, and on the sustainability of food systems. Um, so we've really spread the, the net quite wide today in the different interventions we've had. I think having a culinary anthropologist uh, on one of our panels is, is a great innovation and something that we should, we should pursue further. Um, one of the themes that emerged very clearly as well throughout the day is the need for skills, uh, the need for digital skills, for green skills, and for foresight skills, and to be able to bring those together if we're to really drive this process. On, on the technology front, um, we had, a, again, a very rich discussion. Uh, we heard from uh, Mr. Markula from the Committee of the Regions. Uh, he underlined the importance of the territorial dimension, the development of, in, of digital technology, the importance of the evidence-based approach. Um, as Director General of the Joint Research Centre, I, I, I can't help but thank him for putting up a slide uh, which actually called for a greater use of Joint, joint Research Centre services uh, for policy. Um, uh, thanks to him for that free publicity. Um, we've heard about how technologies can help us to connect uh, GDP to quality and to sustainability, uh, and how we can use them to help to decarbonise energy and resource intensive uh, sectors. And Bertrand Picard was making the point that we need to really shift our mindset to stop talking about problems, uh, to talk about uh, possibilities, to act and to move from possibilities to act to actually how to act. And the panel, I think, uh, in that session really gave some very good examples of how we can act and how we can act now um, to, to really make a difference. We need to have an integrated approach and we need to tackle some of the challenges that we know we're facing in that sector including um, the, the risk of collective inaction and the inability to think creatively and to, and to resolve these problems. And there are a number of very good examples of, of how we can do that um, and how we, how we can help overcome, for example, our reliance on the action of others uh, by moving from a, a mode of thinking which is more around the sphere of control to a mode of thinking which is more around the sphere of influence. How can we influence other parts of the world to move in a, in a beneficial way globally um, by using our influence from within the European Union. Even if we can't do it all ourselves, how can we influence others? I think this was a very important strand of, of, of discussion. That connected with the resilience session that we had, resilience in practice. We had some pretty hard-hitting messages there relating to climate change following the, the very recent COP26 discussions. Um, and the session also shed a lot of light on the challenges that we're facing, um, on the systemic effects uh, that we're facing with the energy transition, and the need, therefore, for robust systemic and system thinking at all levels. We've really got to join the dots and integrate our thinking if we're going to be able to have the action and the progress that we need to have. Uh, we also heard that in order to preserve our, our European model and its values, um, we need to ensure the, the integrity of our democratic space as well and protect our European values. Uh, so it's not just about technology, it's about people, it's about values, and it's about getting all of these different parts of the equation right. And then finally, in this last session, we've delved into how best to use foresight and scenarios to guide our policy process and to enrich uh, our thinking. And I think we've had a really interesting discussion in the last hour We've seen the power of scenarios. We've seen some of the pitfalls that we need to, to be avoiding. Uh, and I think the, the key message here is to have this holistic, uh, joined up approach in which we really integrate uh, and anticipate uh, together, uh, including working with civil society uh, and not just focusing on a, on a black box with the, with, with the policy makers. Um, so I'd like to thank you all for a, for a very, very rich day of discussions. We're going to now start to draw to a close Tomorrow, day two, is going to focus on the more geopolitical trends that are influencing the future of the European Union. It'll contain a number of high-level presentations. There's a great cast coming up tomorrow. Um, on the European side, we've got participants like Federica Mogherini. We've got people from all over the world. We've got General McMaster, who's going to come to give us an American perspective. I'm really looking forward to hearing all of that. I'll see you again tomorrow and for today. Thank you so much, and see you tomorrow at 9.15. Mm -hmm.